Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sarah Reza. It's a great pleasure to have you here. I'm the Guggenheim UBS map curator for the Middle East and North Africa, and the curator of the current exhibition, But a Storm is Blowing from Paradise. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all for the second part of the symposium, Decoupling as Discourse on the Global South. This symposium is something that we have been thinking of throughout the entire duration of the MAP project and ways to summarize what is now the third and possibly final phase of the project as it currently stands. Firstly, I'd like to say that none of this would be possible without the generosity of UBS and of course the wonderful support of my curatorial and education colleagues here at the Guggenheim who've enabled us to put together these wonderful programs such as this symposium and all the performances and public programs that have taken place throughout the course of the entire project. So I'm very grateful to them. This symposium was largely designed to unite all three phases of the MAP project, bringing together my colleagues June Yap, the creator of the South and Southeast Asian phase of the project, and Pablo Leon de la Barra, the Latin American curator. As you all know, MAP is a multi-year, multi-city project which dovetails across different parts of the globe. So concurrent with my project here in New York, Pablo's project was at the South London Gallery um, in London and prior to that at Humex in Mexico City. All three projects have originated here from New York. This was the first showcase of them. So it was a series of acquisitions, curatorial projects, and public programs extending to those that are on the internet also. Today's symposium is really here to highlight some of the multiplicity and some of the challenges that we faced as curators bringing together uh, what is really defined as a geographically specific region and really the ways we used our own strategies, strategies that were more elastic, fluid in their definition, and using those in particular to kind of push back at some of these prescribed definitions. Today's symposium is rather concerned with more ideas about becoming rather than otherness. That is something that is underlining today's discussions. And I'm very, very pleased to welcome back both June and Pablo, as well as a series of wonderful speakers, artists who have participated in the MAP project, artists such as Ergin Chavashulu, whose work is on view here, in But a Storm is Blowing from Paradise, Javier Teller, who has participated in the Latin American phase, and also we also have Rashid Aren, who will be giving a keynote discussion here this afternoon, and Nav Hack, who is the curator, of the Mucha Museum in Antwerp, Belgium. So I thank you all for being here and our speakers. Following two discussions this afternoon, two panels, what's wrong with multiculturalism? And then second, uh, ethnographic turns. There will be a short break between 4.15 and 4.45 in which we will serve coffee and I urge you to go outside and refresh yourself. And then we'll return um, at 4.45 sharp to have a discussion with Public Movement, who have been our artists in residence during my exhibition, But a Storm is Blowing from Paradise. They have uh, performed yesterday with the premiere of Choreographies of Power and have had a long-running performance debriefing, which explored one-to-one -one performance um, about contemporary art practice prior to the State of Israel being built, Palestinian art before 1948 and we'll be joined by the core members of Public Movement, Elena Katsov and Adana Yalomi, and we will then followed by a discussion between ourselves, a triangle of discussion, which will interrogate some of the objectives of the performance and some of the trials and tribulations of working within the institutional history and knowledge. Thank you and welcome. I'd like to welcome now June Yap and her participants to the stage. Thank you very much. Hello and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here with us today, and thank you too to our panel speakers for being part of this first session. What is wrong with multiculturalism? Indeed, what is wrong with it? This is a subject that my fellow curators and colleagues of the MAP Global Arts Initiative have grappled with over the course of five years in the sense of its complexities and even complicities. Certainly, in a proposition of a global and regional project, the question arises of what such a compass and framing might entail. And following that, how such a proposition and its attendant issues may be considered via the prism of art. Coming from Singapore, a young nation state that has multiculturalism embedded in its narrative of emergence and as a condition of continuous negotiation, this is a subject that is pertinent beyond cultural work. In fact, 
In 1988, an exhibition was presented by the artists S. Chandrasekharan, Goi Chu, and Saleh Japa, titled Trimuti, that may be seen as a response to the subject of multiculturalism in its attempt to problematize the influences and inheritances of culture and identity as its aesthetic project. In reflecting on this exhibition a decade after, Ahmad Mashadi was to comment that the issue was not merely in the negotiation of cultural distinction, but rather an uneasy situation arises also when political efficacy is given priority in state-instituted multiculturalism, resulting in a narrowing and a delimiting of cultural patrimony as a consequence of the administrative management of differences in a model that assumes and implements congruity and complementarity. The subject of multiculturalism certainly continues to be an issue today, and its concerns have definitely figured in the development, presentations, and discourses of the MAP initiative, with this panel as a platform for its further disentangling and teasing out. But this disentanglement is not limited to discourse. I think a crucial part of the process in the MAP initiative has also been how art and artists too respond to this subject. So in relation to this, I'd like to share a conversation that came about recently in the midst of the development of this panel in a reference to an artist from Indonesia whom I had included in the first phase of the MAP Global Art Initiative the No Country Contemporary Art for South and Southeast Asia exhibition. This is Reza Avicina with his work titled What from 2001. So my curatorial colleague, Sarah Raza, had asked me about Reza's name and if he had a Persian lineage or association. So I didn't actually know, so I asked the artist, um, whom we also call by the nickname Asung. And he shared that his name comes from an interest by his family in the philosopher and intellectual Avicenna or Ibicina, of Hellenistic Islamic tradition. From Avicenna, you get Avicenna. And yes, the artist confirmed that Reza is a Persian name, although not necessarily because of any Persian bloodline, at least as far as he knows. The artist, in fact, hails from West Java, his lineage tracing to the Sundanese and Chinese of the region. As for his nickname, Asung, it was assigned to him whilst in college in reference to a term, addressed, uh, term of address adopted from a stallholder in central Java. This stallholder would call his customer Sung. And as Reza looked a little Chinese, his friends started calling him Asung. Incidentally, the word Asung is a it is, um, refers, while well, rarely used, refers to um, the meaning of to incite or arouse anger and revenge. As for Avicenna's philosophy, it is grounded in reason and knowledge, and it is therefore quite apt that Reza's early experimental video performance for the MAP initiative presents a reflection on understanding and navigating difference. Short during the Islamic holiday Eid, the artist is seen within the video to be reciting from verses of the Bible on the subject of truth and confession, as well as mindfulness and justice in faith. Lessons that he notes are also conveyed in the Quran. The work is presented as a reflexive moment of spiritual contemplation that is interrupted by a self-inflicted violence, with the artist watching himself as he records his performance. Significantly, the artwork surfaces issues crucial to the considerations of multiculturalism, of the need for preservation and commitment, as well as, as, well as for a relativization from which compassion, empathy, and therefore perhaps knowledge and understanding might arise. What for me is part particularly crucial and that speaks to the versatility of aesthetic expression is how fluidly, yet specifically, the artist navigates what would be a thorny condition of juxtaposing two domains of belief. So with this introduction on the sub, on the, to the complex subject of multiculturalism, I wish to welcome our first speaker, artist, author, and founding editor of Third Text, 
Rashid Arain, to address us. Rashid, please. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Good to see you, all of you. What is wrong with multiculturalism? The question, what is wrong with multiculturalism, had already been answered and dealt with more than 20 years ago by many, among them eminent thinkers such as Salavok, Zizek, and Frederick Jameson. For them, it was a new form of racism. Despite my agreement with them, I feel it is unnecessary to repeat the argument here. What is more important now is to go into the complexity of the, of the issue which goes beyond what is commonly understood by racism. And this complexity lies within the historical trajectory of its development. The history of multiculturalism is in fact the history of both the fascination for and the disorder of the other. And my aim is to go into this history specifically in Britain in order to show why it was necessary for the British state to create and impose multiculturalism upon the people of Asian and African origins. The history of multiculturalism is, however, extremely complex and complicated, with both its contradictions and paradoxes. What I want to say is merely a simplified, rough outline of his picture. I will also use this presentation in this presentation, the word black. For all non-white people in Britain, no matter where they come from, Asia, Africa, and the Caribbean. However, before I proceed further, I want to say something about the presence of Asian and African cultures in the West, the creativity of which you can find in the streets of London, Paris, New York, for example. And this creativity is the genuine creativity of ordinary people. We must recognize the positive aspect of the creativity of Asian and African cultures within the Western metropolises. And it should not be confused with multiculturalism. Multiculturalism, 
as I am going to show here, is what has been created, sponsored, promoted, and funded particularly by the British state and imposed upon those who are defined and treated as minorities in order to prevent them and their cultures from penetrating the mainstream culture of modernism and confront its racist Eurocentric ideology, particularly of the visual arts. The post-war history of Britain is the history not only of the history of its indigenous white people, but also of people from Asia, Africa, and the Caribbean who were brought to Britain by the British state itself to work in the factories to run its uh, transport and hospital and other essential things. They were meant to work and work alone, but when they become visible in the streets, in the pubs, in the shops, when they begin to open their own places of meeting and entertainment, when they start playing their own meeting, it was the beginning of the problem for the white British society, which in fact caused the first Race Royce of Nottingham Hill in 1958 in London. These rights were also attributed to the to, to so-called Teddy Boys and Sir Osmond Mosley Fascist Party and were soon put down through the machinery of peace and order, which was necessary for the economy. What came out from them as the main slogan, keep Britain white, had far-reaching effects. In fact, it has remained fundamental to the ideology of British state, which I said above, involved in both the fascination for and disavowal of what were considered to be alien to British culture. But more significantly, it was the fear of the other cultures which defined and constructed the discourse of multiculturalism. It is also necessary to point out that this fear has been consistently and persistently used by all the ruling classes in Britain to fool and deceive the general public in order to gain support for their own power. The first politician 
who began to articulate and openly express this fear by the respectable and respected parliamentarian Enoch Powell, who delivered his notorious speech of rivers of blood in 1968 in Wolverhampton. His main point was there were too many what he called new immigrants. And he, and because there were too many, they were affecting the basic values of British culture. In his subsequent appearance on TV, he said that he was not a racist, but only worried about the increasing number of immigrants from different cultures. They should therefore be repatriated to the countries of their origin in order to reduce their numbers so that their subsequent small number would not impact upon British culture. On a different occasion, he also said that these immigrants could not become the integral part of the mainstream British life. There was, of course, widespread disagreement with his views, and he was removed from his position in the shadow cabinet of Mr. Heath, but he remained a respected and respectable member of the parliament until his death when he was praised by then Prime Minister Tony Blair for being a good parliamentarian. The consequences of his ideas and views were twofold. First, he laid the foundation for what later led to institutionally legitimized racism of multiculturalism. But more importantly, he unleashed the kind of violence against black people which was unprecedented. While many white workers came out in the street in support of power, white youngsters called skinheads went around attacking in particular Asian people and they called it Paki bashing. In fact, many Asians were killed by them, particularly in East London. All this happened at the time when black people were being used by the system unscrupulously to say the least. It was not unusual for them to work for 16 to 18 hours a day doing dirty jobs in their factories in order to earn enough to survive. 
they also had to put up with the run-down houses without basic amenities. Given their exploitation and operation, and, that and then the racial outburst of Mr. Powell and his resulting violence, it was no surprise that black people had to stand up and fight back. The result of this was the emergence of radical organization within both the Asian and Afro-Caribbean communities in particular, which began to take a stand against not only their exploitation, but also racism. They argued for and promoted the idea of for the post-colonial transformation of the whole British society through revolution, which began to worry the establishment. It was then the establishment began to think of using culture to pacify this development. I repeat, the establishment began to think of using culture to pacify this development. And this was the basis of multiculturalism. Sometime in 1973, the Gulbenkian Foundation invited black organizations for a meeting to discuss what it considered to be their problems, which was attended by many, but also by culture by some including the one I myself belong to, Black Panthers. We don't know what actually went in this meeting, as the minutes of this meeting were never public made public. But it seemed to have concluded that the problem was the problem of African and Asian cultures in Britain. Because soon after, a journalist of the magazine Time Out, Nassim Khan, was appointed by the Gulbankian in association with the commission for the racial equality and the Art Council of Great Britain to investigate these problems. Nassim Khan was assisted in her investigation by a committee which included Stuart Hall, the eminent Marxist academic, and Lola Young, now Baroness Young, and a member of the House of Lords. Ms. Khan, Ms. Khan's report came out in 1976 entitled The British The Arts Britain Ignores 
and subtitled The Art of Ethnic Minority in Britain. Its conclusion being clear from these titles. She then proposed and demanded the straight funding of the traditional arts of Asia, Africa, and the Caribbean, which he considered to be the genuine cultural heritage of black people in Britain. Thus, Karl ethnic minorities culture. However, there was little immediate impact of her report. About two years later, in fact, came another outburst of racism, not from any ordinary person, but the Honorable Margaret Thatcher, who became the next Prime Minister. It was evident that she had used her racism to win the support of white voters, which she did. Here is what she said addressing her voters, and I quote, I think it means that people are really rather afraid that this country might be swamped by people of different culture. The British culture had done so much for democracy, for law, and done so much throughout the world it, that if there is any fear, it might be swamped. Then people are going to be rather hostile to those coming in. Unquote. Her racism does not need any elaboration here, but it was evident to black people what it then meant. Racism was now being openly institutionalized as not much opposition to her views came from within the establishment. There was therefore only one choice left for black people. They themselves had to stand up and fight, resulting in 1981 the uprising of ordinary black people in the major cities of Britain, London, Bristol, Birmingham, Manchester, Bradford, and so on. This was something which was not expected and the establishment began to worry. It therefore had to do something to find what was behind it, if not to pacify the discontent and anger of the black community. It was then that Lord Scarman was appointed by the Prime Minister to investigate the matter. 
Lord Scarman came up with the same conclusion as of the Gulbenkian and Nassim Khan. In his view, it was the problem of other cultures, which could be resolved by the state support and funding of the so-called the art of ethnic minorities. Now, Mr. Thatcher faced the paradox of her own making. She had to support and fund the very same culture she disliked and disowned only a few years ago. In 1982, the Art Council announced the inclusion of ethnic minority art in the future program. And in 1986, received special instruction, in fact, from the Prime Minister herself, to spend 4% of his funding for ethnic minority art. Thus began the official regime of multiculturalism in Britain. Let me now go into the background to all this. to show that there was, in fact, a class struggle which was pacified by multiculturalism. The post-war migration of people from Asia, Africa, and the Caribbean included mostly working class people particularly landless peasantry from the Indian subcontinent. But it also included highly educated people. Excuse me. These people were either educated in their own countries of origin and uh, its new genera younger generation went to school and university in Britain. And by the 1970s, there was substantial black middle class, both of Asian and African origin in Britain whose aspiration and ambition were no different from the white middle class. While black working people were employed in factories, in the transport system, and hospital, and other areas, mostly doing low-paid menial jobs. Most of the educated blacks had no jobs. And they also had to do low-paid low -paid menial jobs. It was these frustrated people from the black middle class who were there in the meeting called by the Gulbenkian Foundation in 1973, and who then supported and, and supported the funding and recommendation by Nassim Khan for the state promotion and funding 
of the tradition of African Asian culture in Britain. However, even then the struggle of black bourgeoisie in Britain was not easy. It had to struggle hard for their respectable place within Britain, and they found it only when the establishment realized the usefulness of this class in defending the system. It was, in fact, the socialist GLC of the Ken Livingston who opened the doors for those who now began to be called ethnic minorities. The GLC set up a special department for this, headed by an Afro-Caribbean, Herman Usli. Now, Baron Usli and a member of the House of Lords, with a section for support and funding for the ethnic minority art, run by a young Asian girl who had no qualification and understanding of art. With the staff of about two dozen people who were recruited, recruited not on the basis of any qualification and merit, but the color of the skin. Although the GLC did create a lot of awareness about the exploitation of black people, particularly owing to racism, its promotion and funding of ethnic minority projects was a disaster. Its promotion and funding of naive and amateurish work as the only artistic achievement of black people was not only an insult to their actual achievement, but contributed further to its institutional neglect, ignorance, and marginalization. Although the Prime Minister, Mrs. Thatcher, abolished the GLC 1986 because of her opposition to GLC's socialist views and policies. GLC's ideas about ethnic minority art were picked up by the Art Council, which then became the basis of his own ethnic minority funding. And although the Art Council now began to fund the ethnic minority project, the real money was there only in 2002 when it announced the budget of about 30 million. That is about $50 million to set up separate centers or projects on the basis of different ethnicities, which, which thus emerged 
centerless Chinese art center, South Asian art and community center, Afro-Caribbean and African center, and so on. Since then, things have changed enormously in Britain, politically, socially, as well as culturally. The slogan of keep Britain wife, sorry, the slogan of keep Britain wide is no longer there. We have no black people in the parliament. Some also as minister, also in the House of Lords, but also most every local council now has ethnic minority staff. But despite all this, the situation on the ground has become worse. Now the British society is much more divided than it was about 20 or so years ago. There is now a widespread discontent, frustration and anger among all sections of society. And many people put the blame on multiculturalism, if not on the so-called immigrants. The former minister, sorry, the former Prime Minister David Cameron himself complaining in 2011 about the lack of community cohesion in Britain said, and I quote, the previous government had been the victim of fear and murder thinking by backing a state-sponsored form of multiculturalism. And then he said, Quote, we have failed to provide a vision of society to which they feel they want to belong, unquote. I did, in fact, write to him asking what he meant by vision of society but he did not reply. My final point was about the impact of multiculturalism on the work of black artists and its institutional legitimization. But I have reached the end of my allocated time and had to be very brief, which actually take me back to what Enoch Powell said in 1968, much before the state sponsored multiculturalism. As I pointed out before, Powell had repeatedly said that he was not racist. But he only wanted black people to remain within their own place. This is very important to remember. He wanted 
the black people to remain within their own place, within their own culture, and should not enter the mainstream and impact it. How was this different from the apartheid in South Africa? The apartheid government always maintained that it was not racist and that the purpose of apartheid was only for the different development for black people based on their own cultural traditions. My point here is to show that black artists in Britain face somewhat similar situation. Artists from Asia, Africa, and the Caribbean began to arrive in Britain in the 1940s. Except except for Ronald Moody, who came here in 1930s. And after some struggle, they become part of what then does become multiracial art scene in London. And so they work along with their white contemporaries they were all part of the same mainstream of modernism. But when their work was looked at and written about, they were treated differently, as their work was now contractualized with their own, within their own culture outside the mainstream. And those some who were on the forefront of the Amagas, particularly of the 60s, were totally neglected and ignored. And their historically important achievement was thus kept excluded from any consideration. However, this is important now. However, some black artists has, have benefited enormously with the emergence of multiculturalism in the 1990s. In fact, to the point of celebrated internationally, but the institutionally recognized and legitimized mainstream history of art in Britain is still of the exclusive achievement of white British artists. And now, the benevolence of multiculturalism, along with those, along with the help of those who have benefited from multiculturalism, is now being used by the establishment to cover a shield is institutional racism. Bravo, multiculturalism. Thank you very much, Rashid, for the very illuminating talk and, I, and um, emphasizing to us the importance of the historical perspective of multiculturalism. Um, but 
Uh, before we go into a discussion, first perhaps we could hear from our second speaker, Nav Haq, Senior Curator of the Museum of Contemporary Art, Antwerp. Nav, please. Thank you, June. Um, thank you, Guggenheim, for the invitation to talk today. It's actually really, for me, a personal honor to talk alongside Rashid. And I think when you talk after Rashid, there's always this question of whether there's anything left to say. <laughs> no, there isn't. There Thanks, must Rashid. you be said. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, <laughs> I think in a certain sense, I'm going to echo the beginning of Rashid's talk, you know, in terms of this invitation to talk about the subject of uh, multiculturalism. You know, when I was given this invitation to talk about this subject, I, I really thought to myself, like, do we, do we really have to talk about this? Do we really have to do it? Um, it's something that I've tried to, as I said, tried to avoid for a long time. And I guess the way I think you could legitimize um, this topic as a, as, a, as a subject of debate is if you actually try and differentiate uh, multiculturalism as a socio-cultural facet from its institutionalized form. I think how June described a sort of state-sponsored multiculturalism, particularly under the, the conditions of um, the, the huge resurgence of the myth of national monoculture, which seems to be once again uh, an alarming uh, global trend. I think that's one way of legitimizing it. The second, in a more personal way, is um, as, a, as a British person now living in uh, mainland Europe, in Belgium. Um, Belgium is a place that's actually, um, in a certain sense, having its first moment now of institutionalized multiculturalism. Um, and it actually makes you realize that some places are having their first moment now, actually many decades after other places. So it makes you, and, you know, actually coming from Britain to Belgium and, and into this particular context, it, you know, I have this really strange feeling. It's a bit like coming from the future or something like that, where you see something that happened in your own country many, many decades ago. So you have a certain sense of how they might might or might not want to address it in their local context. So there is a sort of personal dilemma to what extent you want to get involved in this. But I guess still, ultimately, um, I personally try and work constructively with civil society questions and how culture relates to it. I would say that my own interests are quite broad, looking at questions of internationalism, power relations, uh, universality versus relativism, exclusion, broadly speaking, the intersection of art, society, and politics. Um, as a backdrop, I'm going to uh, have some images from a, a project that I worked on uh, in the Antwerp Museum two years ago. It was called Don't You Know Who I Am? Art After Identity Politics. Um, I organized it together with my colleague Anders Kruger, my colleague in the museum. Um, it's gonna be completely impossible for me to talk about all the artists and works in the show, so there's just gonna be a sort of, uh, a, a load of images of, of the works that were in the exhibition. These were all the artists that were in the exhibition. And if, I, I, what I suggest is if you're interested to find out more, then I, I would go to, uh, you can probably just about see the, the URL after uh where you can see information about all of the artists, about the exhibition. Uh, the the catalogue for the exhibition was purely made as an e-book, so you can download that for free. Um, so I'm basically just going to let going to just let this run as a, as a backdrop whilst I'm talking. Um, so the, the, the subtitle, the more serious subtitle to this exhibition was Art After Identity Politics. And of course, identity politics and institutionalized multiculturalism are closely linked. The term itself, identity politics, has strong historic connotations. 
particularly of the 70s, 80s generation artistic movements, um, where at that particular point there were quite concise constituencies of identity-based practices in art, uh, based around most visibly um, race, gender, sexuality, um, from a particular perspective of uh, social marginalization. Um, of course, necessary as movement, uh, there was a certain, uh, as, as emancipation movements, a sort of desire or a mode of being of, of seek, seeking uh, visibility, sort of visibility politics. Um, very often, th this this sort of desire for vi visibility manifested itself in very particular aesthetic forms. Very often, representations of the self or the body, um, what Peggy Phelan called the economy of reproduction, where there would somehow have to be some sort of connection between um, biography and content, a sort of uh, ontological link between practice and one's uh, cultural background. Um, I think a bit like Rashid, I have a very strong sort of British uh, perspective on this. Um, also, I think a perspective on its, in a certain sense, its decline or its failure as a movement. I think um, for different reasons, there was a sort of uh, failure, partly because of, um, for example, some aesthetic limitations. Uh, also because I think there was a sort of strong realization that the, 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 the transition that people wanted wasn't quite as they hoped. It was more a, uh, a transition from um, marginalization, i.e. outside of the artistic system, to a sort of ghettoization sort of within the artistic system. Um, and a sort of strong sense of uh, what kind of practice somebody would make if they were from a particular background of marginalization. So if you were a, bra a black person in Britain, you'd be expected to make art about being uh, a black person in Britain. I think a key person for me in terms of this discourse is somebody like uh, Arthur Danto, who of course, it's even more than 50 years ago that he wrote his text, uh, The Art World, where he tries to describe actually what, what is it? You know, what is art? What is, what is the art world? And I think there are a lot of things that come up in his writing that we can really sort of take for granted now, but actually somehow still of fundamental importance. You know, it, even basic things like um, the idea that when you have an artwork, an artwork is not an artwork because it looks like an artwork. It's an artwork because the art world says it's an artwork. In that sense, it's about uh, group behavior and group dynamics. And there is somehow a kind of uh, a meme, what I describe as a sort of art world meme, a sort of mimetic behavior. These sort of uh, forms of codification that exist between people that legitimize who can or can't be in the art world or what can and can't be deemed uh, an artwork. This is more the, the invisible side of the art world in contrast to the, the visibility of uh, identity politics. This is sort of some of the things I talk about when I talk about ultimately the, the failure of identity politics. And I think what we were trying to do with this particular exhibition is actually very much based on observation of what artists are doing and the, the fact that we felt there was some sort of reappearance of notions of identity and more broadly speaking, selfhood, but in a completely different way, a more invested in notions of complexity, which the art system has not always been able or willing to accommodate, and through very different aesthetic strategies, through things like abstraction, experiments with uh, non-figurative, representation, performativity, fiction, objecthood, things like object relations, how the sense of the self is formed through our relationship to objects. And many different artistic strategies that might even not even necessarily reinforce each other, but of course 
artists have not ever accepted any kind of ban on self-contradiction. This, I guess there was also a sense of thinking about generationality, something, uh, something that happens with other kinds of artistic movements. Uh, so for example, when we think about things like institutional critique, we see fig figures like Mark, Mark Dion, Andrea Fraser as somehow being like second generation uh, institutional critique artists. And if you were somehow to apply this logic to identity politics, what would that look like? Particularly if, the current, if you think about the current generation, to think about that really in terms of practice and not, say, in terms of age or things like that. Uh, these practices are not necessarily always fun fundamentally from the perspective of marginalization. And where somehow, th because of the different kinds of aesthetic practices, uh, these connections between biography and content are somehow taken away. And really somehow interrogating this question of whether you can have identity without identification. Can you have identity without identification? Uh, looking at the works of these artists, yes, of course you can. So this really was about um, the role of artistic intelligence or artistic propositions. Somehow trying to be constructive in terms of working against any kinds of myths of uh, monoculture, like the kinds that we see within uh, these very much present day right wing identitarian movements which adopts an, uh, an inherently conservative essentialist position. And of course, there are some other fundamental differences between then and now, between the 80s and the present day. Technological advancement, how technology uh, helps us construct and understand what identities are. And of course, the art world is much more uh, international now. Uh, another fundamental difference and what internationalism means and the fact that um, the Western art world has somehow opened itself up to other places. And I think one key factor of this project for us was about how this, these sort of historic forms of legitimation within the art world, uh, where previously marginalized people uh, in a similar way to how it eventually legit legitimized those who were socially marginalized in their own societies in the 70s and 80s via institutionalized multiculturalism are somehow now mirrored within the, within the framework of arts internationalism. These sort of codifications that are in place uh, that allow people um, to be determined whether they're allowed on the inside or the outside uh, based on whether there can be these, these sort of connections between uh, biography and content, culture and content. And really, I, I just wonder whether there's a, a sort of real lack of awareness of this mirroring in today's internationalism with the uh, institutionalized multiculturalism of a few decades ago, raising the question of how to interact with an international artistic scene. That's what this exhibition wanted to address. There were sort of many outcomes uh, for us in terms of this project. One of them was through the necessity, whether there is a necessity still to use terms like identity politics or multiculturalism anymore. Probably not. At the very least, because of their historic connotations that ultimately form a kind of baggage which is not necessarily always useful for artists working today. And I think there needs to be some kind of radical reorientation of what was previously referred to as identity politics. It's already happening in practice. Uh, and I would argue that somehow the system is lagging behind. Perhaps I would suggest a better way of dealing with the situation is to have some kind of faith in the idea that artists possess more intelligence than the artistic system. Mm. Mm. I think I could probably leave it at that point. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Rashid and Nav. I was really enjoying listening to both of you speak and, and looking at um, where both of you are coming from. On the one hand, looking at the history of multiculturalism, and on the other hand, um, the contemporary navigation of uh, this inheritance, actually, of a problematic multiculturalism. Um, and I, I think the, the problem is on multiple levels. On the one hand, the historical um, aspects of it, you know, recalling what has happened before and um, the necessity of that as a narrative, and then at the same time, um, navigating it in a practical and, and on a day-to-day -day operational sort of basis, whether as curators, as artists. Um, um, and I think one thing that came up was um, the subject of legitimation, which both of you kind of brought up. And I'm, and I'm thinking of um, you know, what you think might be useful possible strategies to address legitimation today. You know, do we construct um, new forms of legitimacy, new agents of legitimacy? I mean, yes. I think um, for me, that, um, the thing about this, this particular mm. process of legitimation um, is strongly connected with this idea of the meme that I'm talking mm. about, this little art world meme. Yeah. And I think the first thing is somehow that there needs to be more an awareness of it uh, existing. Right. right. Um, even at the level of education. You right. know, because you know the, the amount of times I, I go to visit um, students in art school, mm. uh, and of course there's something very specific about the art uh, the art school environment. It's mm. it's it's different. It's about um, being the best student that what you can be. Mm -hmm. You know, and then as soon as you leave art school, it's not like that anymore because mm. it's the art world is not necessarily based on meritocracy anymore. Mm. And there's somehow a sort of lack of awareness of this uh, difference. And the right. amount of people that I meet right. who just have uh, completely uh, unaware of the fact that it is about sort of a, a group dynamic. Yes. So I think uh, on a very basic level, mm -hmm. like an, an, an awareness that uh, the culture field has a, has, a, has, a, has a sort of particular way of functioning would, would probably sort of make a, a, a big difference. Yes. Yeah. Um, I suppose, in, in a way, we're, we're all kind of part of this as well. Yourself, you know, curating, and um, and uh, I, perhaps a, a way in which you were working through that was through the exhibition that you took us through, as well. Um, but well, as as a curator, I also am encountering the same sorts of questions and attempting to navigate. Um, the, well, the complexities that we've been talking about. But I'm also wondering in the case of, uh, well, from Rashid, from your point of view, um, what about for artists? You know, what, what can artists then do? What to, to address this Use problem? Use their imagination. <laughs> yes. Well, actually, yeah, that's probably the answer. Um, would you like to elaborate a little more? <laughs> Perhaps for yourself, perhaps, for, uh, in your practice. In my practice, hmm. there are so many things. I don't know if I can elaborate them here. Hmm. However, I think I should make one point, which are the beaches of historical importance. Mm -hmm which RCC has not recognized. Right from the beginning of modernism, art became multiculturalist. Mm -hmm. Let's take the example of Picasso. You have Africans, mm. you have Spain in it, you have Sudan in it, and then his own view of all these cultures. And he managed to bring them together to produce one language. 
which was synthetic. Then we can move to Parsley, mm -hmm. who was inspired by the Islamic in the North Africa. You can look at Matisse, particularly his uh, paper cuts mm -hmm. in the end, where you frequently find the idea of symmetry. So multiculturalism is there yes. within our history because Art history is still Eurocentric. Mm -hmm. That means the center of the consciousness which produces art history lies in Europe. Mm -hmm. This consciousness can do anything it wants. It can bring things from Asia, Africa, and anywhere. But it doesn't give them equality in the production of what they do. Hmm. Because they say what they bring in is not a dialogue between these cultures. For Picasso, there was no dialogue between Africa and himself. For Picasso, Africa was the raw material. Yes. It's all extracted. Very much like a capitalism, yeah. which can use material from all over the world and transform it to something technologically and claim uh, it to be its own creation. So it's a very complex problem. It has many layers of multiculturalism. What we are talking today is a very specific formation which had taken place mm -hmm. last 20 or so years, yeah. which was imposed upon so-called ethnic minorities because they didn't want to be part of the mainstream. Because if they allowed them to come in, then they will disturb the whole idea of Eurocentrism. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I think you've, you've touched on a lot of very important points, both in your talk and, well, in your response as well. And yes. Um, uh, no, I well. can go what uh, Naib said, uh, internationalism. Mm. They are no longer international. It's a globalization now. Mm. In globalization, all culture has entered mm. into the discourse of globalization not on the basis of art, you want being artist. Mm. No. Art is a secondary thing. You enter into global as a, as a Chinese, as an Indian, as an Arab, mm. as an Iranian, as an African. First, you have to establish your identity, then you present your work. Yes, it's true. So that answers your question. Mm -hmm. How it mirrors mm -hmm. in the globalization. Yes. Yeah.
and the difficulty of also trying to find strategies to resist them. Does anyone else have questions? No? Okay, perhaps, well, it, perhaps if there are questions. I uh, hope you <laughs> have not been intimidated. <laughs> Come on, say something. <laughs> Don't ask questions, just say something. Please. <laughs> it's more like I'll start with a comment, but it, it, it is a question that I've been thinking and mulling it over. I happen to be a Turkish artist. I've been living in this country for over 40 years. There is a confusion that is also constantly perpetuated by the art by the artists by, and also by the art mechanism. Um, and right now I felt I had to speak and maybe ask a question um, because it's, I'm prefacing it for a while first. Um, I, I, I appreciate what you said and that's why I just had to say this. I feel like we're in a position of total hypocrisy claiming this thing about globalization or internationalization and then um, what is really happening is um, the powerful West, of uh, which I've kind of become a member, is <coughs> usurping all artistic values and shifting them and then making them, shuffling them around and then creating this other structure in the form of museums, galleries, collections, collectors, stratification of artists and notions of art and creativity, and then passing it along. And then this is not just happening on a global scale, also on a local scale, because I, as an artist of you know, so many, many years, after some level of success and some level of failure, which I basically um, am impervious to at this point, have realized that it's almost like a game that you want to jump into, but it doesn't really include a lot of people. And then what you do, and I'm not talking just about myself, there are, I would believe, hundreds and thousands of us out there who are both American artists and international artists who have never even been able to get into the conversation. So slowly the international conversation or the dialogue has become you know, a monologue and then like a soliloquy. And when we talk about decoupling as discourse on the global south, I was thinking basically it really has become a case uh, when I look at the works too, there is no such thing as local art. I'm not talking about crafts. I mean, there's a certain level of sophistication. I'm, I apologize to everybody for taking your time, but at least for the sincerity of my... Uh, of my ideas, it should be heard, because I'm not speaking just as some Turkish artist here in America, it's not about that. It's more about the status of the arts, what's happening to art, how it has been really usurped from artists as well, both economically and in terms of trend setting. You know, it's become such a messed up situation, and if, you know, I can think of other words other than just like globalization, it's almost like a trend setting that's initiated by the West and slowly through these institutions, Guggenheim Museum included in them, it becomes like this, uh, this other structure that at the end eliminates art. So what happens is people, like collectors buy because they buy by the, with their ears. <laughs> they don't really buy because they understand the work or they, understand, they like what they're seeing, but it's become such a material. And then, then slowly, like Chinese artists, who I believe have, or Asian artists, who I believe have immense talent and history, end up kind of creating works that try to challenge this idea. So anyway, is there anything in terms of globalization that can make this situation a better situation for all artists. Because what I'm seeing is basically it's being 
hijacked by, art, by the art authorities of the West? That's my question. Thank you. It's, it's definitely a very complex situation. And what, Nav, would you like to respond? <laughs> Thanks, Prune. You're welcome. <laughs> I don't know if I really have an easy answer. I mean, uh, talking personally, I try my best, you know. I, uh, I try to do things a bit differently. Um, I, I think these things are also uh, a bit generational as well. I, I don't know if I agree that there's no such thing as local art anymore. Maybe you're touching on an American problem, I don't know. But, you know, where, where I live now, um, in Belgium, there, there definitely is. You know, there's a strong tradition, for example, of um, figurative painting that is very easily traceable back to Flemish primitives. And that's just one example. I think it's in many places, you know. Um, and I think those kind of conditions of practice are also quite important to recognize. I think that's one key thing, rather than this sort of uh, floating layer of sort of consensus internationalism that the art world tends to... Uh, revolve around, you know. Um, I think there are individuals that are trying to do things differently, but I think you're right, there is a sort of wider structural problem. A uh, dominant market that has a whole other motivation. When you yeah. want to be an, uh, an artist, I repeat, when you want to be an artist, you have a problem. <laughs> Give up art and be creative. Well, with that, perhaps we can wrap up this uh, session. I think we have quite exceeded our time as well. Um, I would like to thank Rashid and Nav and all of you um, for this. Yeah.